little picture to open it up with. See, she does all the things. All right, so the opener picture, I like to show a picture every week of what my family does when I'm studying. So this week, my husband, he's the husband in the front. Um, and he took the kids to my son's basketball game. I'm a terrible mother. I don't go to all his games. My neighbor in the front row up here is awesome. She drives my son to and from basketball when we can't. But my people, there's three of them, and then there's two freebies. Those are nephews in the back. Grandma also came and brought some, some people in the crowd to cheer. So those are my people. And every time I lecture, I try to bring a picture of them. So. All right, well, let's uh, open with prayer. If you need notes, there are still notes floating around. I don't know where they are, but they tell me they're there. If you can't find them, again, we get you your money back at the door. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for each and every woman that has come here today that's given of their time, that's given of their time in the homework, God. We're not just doing this for more knowledge of uh, Bible trivia, God, but we're doing it to lean in to know more of you. I pray now that you would calm my heart, calm my nerves, um, bring humility in me uh, to this message. Let me articulate the message I feel that you've put on my heart to share with these women today. And maybe it, it be a blessing to their heart to renew them and encourage them in difficult seasons. We praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. So the verse I put at the top of your notes was Habakkuk 1, verse 2. How long, O oh Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear or you will not listen, maybe your translation said. I kind of felt like I was asking this question of how long, O oh Lord, will I try to write these lecture notes and I won't be able to do it. Um, there was a lot of going back and forth in what I was going to talk about today, but I finally settled on what I believe the Lord had for us today. So the first point in your notes is just a question for you to ponder and think about. Who do you go to with your questions? Who do you go to with your questions? I had heard a speaker talk recently and they said, when the wheels fall off, and this is your blank, to whom do you go? So in life, when the wheels fall off in life, to whom do you go? For each one of us in this room today, when the wheels fall off, it'll look different. It could be a financial situation or strain. It could be a divorce has occurred. It could be a disease has been diagnosed. It could be that there's been a death with a loved one or a friend. But to whom do you go when the wheels fall off is my question. I think to question is very human. God has created us with wonderful minds. And in our minds, we kind of want to make sense of the world around us. So we question and we ask. But who do you go to with those questions? Next point is, who do you call or who do you call on for help? Oftentimes we have uh, different ways that we all cope. Sometimes we will self-medicate or cope and we'll turn to a substance, we'll turn to food, we'll turn to an unhealthy pattern in our life when we really are needing just help. But when we call for help, who are we calling on? First little bullet point there, bringing it back into our minor prophet today, Habakkuk. That's where Habakkuk begins in chapter one. He's asking God, why don't you do something? He's asking that question in verse two of chapter one, how long must I call for help and you do not listen? I like this quote by John Bloom in your notes. This is gonna be your next blank. We reach places where it's painfully clear that our sense of time urgency must be different than God's. Who's ever been there? Our sense of time urgency must be different than God's. I totally resonated with this quote. This prophecy in Habakkuk is different because he's not addressing the nation as a whole. He's addressing his burden, this oracle to God. He's bringing his questions to God. He's not necessarily prophesying to the people. He's speaking and communicating with God what's on his heart, what's burdening his heart. Every piece the prophet presented to God of injustice, of violence or wrongdoing was an opportunity for the prophet to grow in his knowledge of God. 
That's your next blank. So sometimes we just see these random injustices or random acts of violence or seemingly random uh, wrongdoings and we're asking it, what is this all about? Those are opportunities for us to grow in our knowledge of God. Take your questions to God. Your knowledge of God will grow when you do that. Next point, notice how God is with the minor prophet through the suffering. The title of your notes today is God with us in our suffering. Habakkuk is indicating with this whole book, these three chapters, God is with him in the suffering. Habakkuk asks the question of God, God answers. Habakkuk asks again, God answers. God is with him through his suffering. Perhaps there wouldn't be an immediate transformation of his circumstances or the circumstances of the nation around him, but he will get at the end of this book, a beautiful revelation of God's character. Again, his knowledge of God is growing. I'd like to read to you Habakkuk 3, verse 2, if you want to open up there. It's on page 767 in my Bible, if that helps you. If you got this little dandy, handy dandy little Bible, 767 in my Bible. But Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. We'll wait till you get there. Side note about this little Bible. A woman in my group gave me this Bible on one of the darkest days of my life. And I love that woman. She's in the group. But here today, I'm not going to point her out. But one of the darkest days of my life, I was given this beautiful gift. Habakkuk 3, verse 2. Lord, I have heard the report about you. And I fear, O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So according to Habakkuk 3.2, the prophet now knows God's power from the past. He's remembering that, and he's going to count on it for the future. So sometimes in our difficult circumstances, sometimes in our pain, we need to remind ourselves God has been faithful in the past. We remember his work, and we're going to count on that faithfulness for the future. He will be with us in that future suffering. Point number two in your notes, we are awaiting people. We're all waiting for something in this room, waiting for the Lord's return, waiting for a loved one to come back, waiting for a child of ours to come to the faith. We are awaiting people. Throughout the whole Bible, it's always been people waiting, waiting for Messiah, waiting for the Savior, waiting for the Savior to then return. All of us as humans are awaiting people. I wanted to share with you Psalm 25, verse 3, on, who we, on whom we are waiting on. So Psalm 25, verse 3 beautiful verse, a psalm of David, says this, Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. But David says, Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. We wait for the Lord. Philip Yancey had a quote I really liked, and Philip Yancey says this, I have learned... That faith means trusting, that's your blank, in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's your last blank on that quote. Philip Yancey says, I have learned that faith means trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Was that? Hindsight, exactly. I thought I got the quote wrong. You're like, uh-uh, Philip didn't say it that way. <laughs> All right, hindsight, exactly. Hindsight's 50-50. Okay, I mean, 20-20, not 50-50. getting my metaphors mixed up today. Coffee is flowing. Woo! Okay. Uh, point C, each one of you in this room, I love this. I stole this also from Dane Ortland. Each one of you is a piece of art designed to be beautiful and thus draw attention to your artist. So we've all heard before that we are like beautifully made and wonderfully made, which we are, the psalmist says, 
but think of it as art. Each one of you is a beautiful piece of art that's designed to be beautiful. Why? To draw attention to your artist. I love that. Art takes time. Fine art takes even longer, lifetimes of working towards this wonderful masterpiece. What is God creating in you today? What picture is he painting that the greatest artist of all time could only make and create in you in your life? So every piece of your life could represent a puzzle piece. So we have all these puzzle pieces of our life that some are dark, some are light, some don't seem to fit together at the time. We have some that are pretty, some that are not so pretty pieces of our life. Every part of your life is a puzzle piece that at the time just kind of seem like, what is all this? In time, you'll be able to have the full image come together and create what God's creating, but it can't be understood in the moment of that piece later at the end of our lives, we'll understand what he was creating, what he was making through all of it. Every piece of your life is an opportunity to, for you to grow in your knowledge of God. I love listening to women and, and people of the faith that have walked amazing journeys in the faith. One of my favorites is Corey Ten Boom. I absolutely love the nuggets Corey Ten Boom explains because she's very simple. She's passed away now, spoiler alert. But she's very simple in her illustrations so that I could understand. So Corey Ten Boom said something I really enjoyed, and she gave a train illustration. She said, when a train goes through a dark tunnel, and you're on the train, and you're going through this dark tunnel, do you just rip up your train ticket and jump off the train in the midst of that dark tunnel as the train's going through? No, you sit tight in the dark and you trust the one who's driving the train. I love that. When you're going through a dark tunnel, when you're going through suffering in this life, you don't just rip up the ticket. God, you just, where are you? You sit tight and you trust the one who's driving the train. You trust him in the dark. Point number three in your notes, only the Lord could carry me through. I should have made it a quotation there because that's something Corey Ten Boom said about her story. In a little bit, I'm going to show you an interview of Corey Ten Boom through video. But she said through her extensive suffering in the faith, for the faith, she said, only the Lord could carry me through. Corey Ten Boom said, when you go through terrible suffering, Jesus is still with you. Do not forget those truths because suffering has a way of shielding our eyes from sometimes very obvious spiritual truths. The suffering is so intense, it's so close to home, we can forget that Jesus is with us in the midst of terrible suffering. So Brandy is now going to play our seven minute clip. Uh, Michelle, can you hit the lights to turn them down, please? Here's a disclaimer. It could look like a really bad Japanese movie because we have to get our sound that has to be like done one way to match the video playing through the church's computer. So if it looks like a terrible, like low budget film, it is, okay? So just bear with us. The words and the sound may not match, but we're gonna leave it up to the Lord. Should this whole thing go south and the wheels fall off, the link here in your notes, you can watch it later on your own time. If you don't know how to figure out YouTube, call your, your leader. Okay, here we go. Sure. 
options is that you, you can not uh, do anything anymore. You can only vote for this kind of control. And that is good in my experience also. But I have always believed, now I know from my experience that this is science is stronger than the Greek science. And a general copy of the show you always Thank you. 
Thank you, Randy, for playing that. I want to recap some of the things um, in a longer interview that Corey Ten Boom suffered through. This uh, interview was 49 years ago. In summary, though, of some things that Corey Ten Boom suffered, <clears throat> for four months she was uh, in solitary confinement. She spent a total of 11 months in concentration camps under uh, Nazi rule. Um, her and her sister were confined to a living quarters that was meant for 200 bodies, but in the conditions she was put into, 700 prisoners were placed into uh, that those living quarters. Monica, I believe you've been to Rob Robinsbrook, or you've mentioned something in the past. Okay. Okay. Same horrible. That's okay. That's right. Yes. Okay. Um, I loved how when Pat Robertson in, is that his last name? 700 club guy. Okay. Good. I almost said Pat Sajak. Cause I'm like way younger. He didn't do the interview. Pat asked her, what kept you up while you were a prisoner? And what did she say? She responded back. Who kept me up was the correct question to be asking. Uh, she said in a, a longer interview that every morning roll call was three hours long, where they would have to stand there for three hours to go through roll call. And she said during those times is when God gave her the message she was to teach in her barracks or in her quarters later. That's when she got the best messages to preach and teach later to the women that, with the Bible that she had smuggled in. And God used those horrible circumstances to reach people that were in some of the deepest suffering this world has ever known by hands of the evil one. <clears throat> there are circumstances in your life you will face, she said, where you can't do anything. Only the Lord can carry you through. She said in there, it was hard to hear because of the quality of the sound, but she said, I had always believed now I know from experience that Jesus' light is stronger than the deepest darkness. I had always known and believed that, but now she knew it from experience that Jesus' light is stronger than the deepest darkness. In a longer interview, she recounts the worst thing that they did to her personally that she recounted was when they stripped her naked. They had done that to her a total of seven times where she would have to just be naked in front of who knows who. She said in, in this interview, sometimes she lost courage. And she would ask God, have you forgotten your child? I love how she tagged on the end her name like he didn't know. Have you forgotten your child, Corey Ten Boom? She asked of God. Her heart was questioning. She said that God remembered her in those terrible places. And the, the movie clips that they showed, The Hiding Place, she said the point of making that movie, the point of the movie, The Hiding Place, was to show when you go through terrible suffering, Jesus is still with you. She also attests to the fact that Jesus is the victor. Years later, uh, a Jew that Corey had helped and helped hide, she met up with him again and he went to an old bureau dresser and pulled out the gold star that the Jews were to wear. And he gave it to her. And he said he had saved it. And the reason um, he kept it was, it was a reminder, the gold star of David that he had to wear. He said, whatever is hardest to bear, love can transform into beauty. Corey risked her life to hide people for the Lord to save them. I just thought it was a powerful testimony of someone suffering so grievously, but yet the rest of her life, she traveled extensively to teach and to preach and proclaim who God was, that evil wasn't going to have the last word, that man's evil was not going to be the ending of her story, that she would teach of God's faithfulness and that Jesus was with her through the suffering. Um, if you're interested in her story, there's a revised edition. I think it was like, it's on sale right now on Amazon, The Hiding Place. You can watch the film. I think it 
it's pretty old, so the quality is not the greatest. My grandma showed it to me when I was in fifth grade. I'll never forget that movie. I'm pretty sure my mom wouldn't let me watch it that young, but it was it was important for me to see and to be made aware of what people have endured and and how they came through it triumphant triumphantly in the Lord, and their faith was even stronger. Um, she has a fantastic story if you ever get a chance to read her story. So now I want to turn to scripture, Isaiah 43, verses 2 through 3. They're in your notes, so you can turn in the pages of your Bible, or you can look on your notes. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the river, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I added my own emphasis there on I will be with you. God tells us over and over in Scripture, do not fear, I am with you. Recently, uh, my neighbor had, had to undergo a, a four-hour surgery. Um, she's, she's battling breast cancer right now. And um, I just asked the Lord, Lord, my neighbor is in the hospital right now. Yes, I'm praying for her right now, but what else could I say to her husband through a text to encourage him right now as he's in the waiting room, waiting for this surgery to go, um, to go through and happen? So the Lord put this verse that I just read to you, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Um, so I sent that verse to my neighbor, uh, to her husband, and he immediately texts back and said, my dad, so his dad is in his 80s and is a retired pastor. He said, my dad just read those very words to Julie before she went back for surgery. And it was like, God's like, here's a confirmation from your father-in-law. He's going to read God's word over you that I will be with you through your neighbor who's just anxiously at home praying, you know, worrying for you. But God was with my neighbor, Dan, in the waiting room to receive confirmation that he sees his children. He sees them in their deepest, darkest, trying circumstances, that he sees them and he knows what they need at that moment. So your next arrow point below the verse, God may not answer us as soon as we want him to, but he will answer when we need him to. God may not answer as soon as we want him to, but ladies, make no mistake, he will answer when you need him to. Corey Ten Boom says something about her dad once told her when she was a little girl. She said, Dad, I don't think I could ever have this great faith that I, I don't think I could bear up under these trials that we're going to encounter in our faith. And her dad said, Corey, when do I give you the ticket when we're headed to whatever city? When do I give it to you? And she says, when I need it. God will give you the strength to endure his presence, provision, protection when you need it. Right now, I can't imagine going through something like Corey Ten Boom survived, but I know my God is faithful to give me what I need when I need it. I may not have it at this moment, but God is sure faithful in the past, and he can only be faithful because that's his character in the future, and he does not change. Do not forget that. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31, I'd like to read to you. To be reminded of verses that, beca that can become so familiar, but to take them on afresh like they're new to you today. Listen to this, Isaiah 40, verses 29 to 31. Under the heading, The Greatness of God. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who, like, who lacks might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. This is what the greatness of our God is, ladies. Notice how Habakkuk closes his book. The very ending of the book is, is so very beautiful. In a prayer song form, he, he acknowledges 
who God is and who God is in his suffering. Corey asked that question in her interview and she said, or not asked, she made the comment, there was times I lost courage. So I want you to ask yourself today, in whatever your suffering is today, have I lost courage? And if you have, he is faithful still. Habakkuk closes his book in chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. I'm just going to read to you. He says, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That's your blank there. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Verse 19, the Lord, my Lord, is my strength. Different translations could say the Lord God is my strength. But Habakkuk here is, yet the wheels fall off in life. Whatever may come, whatever devastation may come through this coming judgment, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, despite all of this. Because the Lord, my Lord, is my strength. So this Christmas season, I want you to think about, we always hear the song, uh, Christmas carols that proclaim the word Emmanuel, which is God with us. But this Christmas season, when you hear the word Emmanuel in a Christmas Eve service or any church service, think about Emmanuel, God with us in our suffering. I wrote a post-it here. I'm going to close with reading. At just the right moment, God came down in the flesh as Jesus. At just the right moment, he left his Holy Spirit to indwell us and comfort us here on this earth in our suffering. And at just the right moment, he will return. Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge and testify to your goodness, Lord. Each woman in this room has undergone suffering of some kind or is going under suffering of some kind, God. Make our eyes open to the women around us who are suffering and who need reminders of your goodness, of your character, of your truth. Help us to be a body of believers who are unified, who are looking after those who have gone off, who need encouragement for their weary souls. Lord, I pray for every woman in this room whose heart is weary. I pray for the one in this room whose heart um, has just become so fearful, God, that they don't know what to do with it, Lord. I pray for those who have lost their courage, God, that you would remind them of who you are, that you are the fearless one, that you, God, are the victor, that you are with us in our suffering. We praise your holy name today. God be glorified through this talk. In Jesus' name, amen.